Hello, I'm Michael Hammer, and what we're going to do now is explore the concept of the process organization in somewhat more depth, particularly from the management point of view. Now, I'm going to assume that you've seen our other video about understanding processes, and that you have an appreciation for the concept of process and process work. As you may recall, at the end of that video, we introduced the idea of a process organization. And we defined it very simply as an organization that supports the performance of process work and consequently yields and harvests the benefits that we can get from process work. Low levels of non-value adding work, lower costs, higher speed, greater customer satisfaction. And I assume you're saying to yourself, hey, that's pretty cool. I'd like to have one of those. What do we have to do to get one of these around here? And that's what's going to be our focus. We're going to look at what it takes to put a process organization in place, and then in particular, what it means to you as a manager, what your role has to be to make that kind of process organization work on an ongoing basis. Now, you start to think about a place, an environment, where the people on the front lines are capable of doing process work. Where do you start to create that kind of environment? What do they need? Well, I'd suggest to you that they need several things to be in place if they're actually going to work in a process style. First category of things they need, I call process tools. Certain capabilities they need if they're actually going to perform process work. And I think if you think about it, these are pretty obvious. The very first thing they need is an awareness of the process. They have to know the process. They have to know what the other processes in the business are. They have to understand how their work contributes to this process, how their process relates to the others, and how the whole thing fits together and adds up to the value that the customers really require. In other words, they need an awareness of the entire business in process terms. That means one of the very first things you're going to have to do is identify the processes in your business. Now let me assure you, you have processes in your organization. You've got customers, you're creating value for them. By definition, there are processes. But as we said in the other video, those processes are buried, they're hidden, they're invisible. What you have to do is uncover them. You have to be aware of them and you have to make everyone aware of them. So it's a program of identification and education not necessarily in a traditional classroom environment, but everybody has to know what the processes are. So that if I come on a visit and I stop someone in a hallway or on a manufacturing floor and I say, tell me, what's your process? They can tell me. They can tell me the process. They can tell me where they fit in. They can tell me the result and what the customers expect. That's the starting point, identification and awareness. The second thing you need is to have a design of every process. A design merely specifies who does what in what order. In other words, what people's jobs are in the context of the process, how the process is going to get done. Unfortunately, in traditional organizations, many processes are haphazard and ad hoc. They were never really designed in any organized way, and consequently, they don't produce predictable results on a repeatable basis. You need a design. You have to understand it, you have to know it, you have to document it, and everybody involved has to be aware of it. That way, if I'm a process worker, I know the process and I know how it's supposed to be done. So the first two elements, as we said, awareness and design. The third critical tool that the people on the front lines are gonna need is a team structure. Remember, process work is team work. By definition, it's a group of activities typically performed by a group of people. In traditional organizations, those people don't know each other. They're scattered all over. We have to make people aware of the teams in which they're part. We have to identify those teams and give them some standing in the organization. Now, teams also require supporting facilities. It's very awkward for teamwork to proceed in our traditional office environment where everybody has his or her own cubicle 
our own office. That doesn't support process work. We have to design co-located facilities so that people working together actually work together. They see each other and that the physical flow supports the logical flow of the process itself. And finally, the fifth tool we need to support process work is computer systems, information technology. We need to support integrated processes with integrated systems. In fact, in traditional organizations, the process fragmentation and the functional fragmentation is reinforced by our conventional systems. Remember, every department has its own system. There's the marketing system, the manufacturing system, and the logistics system, each designed to optimize the individual castle. And of course, they don't fit together. They don't integrate. They don't communicate. We can't have that. If you're going to have the work fit together, they have to be supported by a system that fits together. Fortunately, there's a new generation of systems, somewhat awkwardly known as ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning Systems, which really are process-oriented integrated systems. You need to put in place that kind of system to support your process people if they're going to get their work done. So those are the very basic tools that have to be put in place if process work is to get done. But that's not enough. Because if I'm a person on the front lines of an organization, you can give me all the tools in the world. You can give me all the training in the world. I can have the systems. I can have the facilities. I can have the knowledge. I can be organized with my team. And it's not going to get done unless I care unless I want to do process work. Because process work is defined by a different mentality, remember? It's I'm not just looking out for myself, I'm not just taking care of my job, I'm thinking about the customer, I'm thinking about my team, I'm doing what needs to be done rather than what I'm told to do. That demands a set of new attitudes. And attitudes are at least as important as tools if I'm really going to have a process organization. How do I go about creating and reinforcing those process attitudes among our frontline workers? I need attitudes like teamwork, self-starting, autonomy, responsibility, concern for the customer. You know, all the kinds of attitudes you don't have in your organization today. How do I get them? Well, we see three drivers of process attitudes, three things that you have to pay attention to. First is measurement. There is no commitment to processes without an equal commitment to process measurement. You need to put in place measurement systems that do not focus piecemeal on individual castles, individual tasks, individual activities, but instead measure processes on an end-to-end -end basis. Many organizations have started gradually in this direction. Some of the work in activity-based costing and activity-based management is a first step in this direction, but a lot more needs to be done. You need to define what the appropriate end-to-end -end measures for your process are. You have to figure out how you're going to collect that information, and then you have to disseminate it across the organization so people know how the process is performing. If you tell people about process performance, you tell them about the goals for process performance, that gets them oriented toward a process attitude and a process mindset. You need to reinforce that measurement with compensation. And that's the second driver of process attitudes. Everybody's take home pay has to, at least in part, be shaped by the performance of the process. It's very hard to get people to care about process when you're paying them on something else. If you're paying them just for showing up, or you're paying them for task efficiency, you create confusion, cognitive dissonance, and incipient schizophrenia when you tell them that they have to pay attention to process. If you tell them process is important, you got to measure process, and you got to at least in part pay on process as well. The third driver of process attitudes is creating the right culture in the organization as a whole. We need to reshape the values and attitudes that everybody believes in and everybody holds as being significant. 
you know, traditional attitudes are my work doesn't matter, keep the boss happy, look out for number one. We got to get rid of those. It's got to be keep the customer happy. My work makes a real difference and we're all in this together. And it's up to the leadership of the organization through personal role modeling and communication and all the other tools at the executive's disposal to create that kind of culture to reinforce the attitudes we want of people on the front lines. If you provide people with these tools and you engender in them these attitudes, you're well on your way to having them do process work. Now, sounds like a pretty complete picture. Who's missing? The answer is, you are. We have not yet talked about what managers do in a process organization. It's clear what value-adding workers do. It's clear what people on the front lines do. They do real work with less non-value-adding activity. They do it with a customer focus, a process mindset in a team context. So what do you need to do? The first answer is, not very much. Traditional management is by and large irrelevant in a process organization. Managerial work is by its nature non-value adding. Let's face it, managers don't design products, they don't sell products, they don't serve customers. And according to the Bible, they reap not, neither do they sow. In fact, if you're a manager, I want you to get up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and say, I add no value. It's great for the soul. What do you do? Well, the role of a manager in a traditional castle fragmented organization is to serve as glue to hold the pieces together. You supervise people to make sure that they do their work right. You incent them, you control them. You answer questions, you make the decisions, and then you make sure that their piece integrates with other people's work. You know what? We don't need any of that stuff. People have the knowledge, they have the authority, they have the autonomy to make their own decisions. They have the incentives through process measurement and process compensation to do the right thing without you looking over their shoulders. In fact, all you do is get in the way. Process workers are big picture thinkers with broad knowledge. They don't need anybody to help them put the pieces together. They'll do it themselves. Does that mean we don't need any managers? Certainly not. We do need managers. Managers have critical roles to play in a process organization, but their roles are transformed beyond recognition. And the third critical arena of a process organization is management that's aligned around process. To understand the needed role of managers in a process organization, let's return for a second to people and the tools they need. Remember, we said they need awareness and design and technology and facilities. Question, where does that come from? How do they get it? Now, maybe you say they go forage for it on their own. That's a very bad idea. First of all, it takes a lot of time, and I don't want them having to divert themselves from doing the real work to creating and finding those tools they need. Secondly, we might have multiple teams doing the same process. I don't want them doing things differently. There's an important phrase, empowerment is not anarchy. The authority to make decisions about the work doesn't mean you can do whatever the hell you want and every different group is going to do whatever they want. That inflicts confusion on customers, means that some teams will do better than others and makes it very difficult to make it all fit together. You need a standard design for a given process that everybody is going to follow with certain acceptable degrees of freedom. Where does that design come from? Moreover, I can't ask a team to come up with its own design because they may not have the skills required to develop process design. That's a real particular skill which they may not have had time to acquire. Who gives them the tools they need to perform the process? The answer is managers. And in particular, a new kind of manager that we call the process owner. The process owner is a critical management role in the process organization. 
To put it simply, the process owner has end-to-end -end responsibility and authority for a process. He or she is the person to make sure that the process gets done and gets done effectively. Now, even though the term process owner has become widespread, I'm not entirely comfortable with it because it has somewhat of a misleading impression. It suggests that the process owner is the only person who has ownership of the process. In fact, that's wrong. Everyone involved in performing the process must have ownership of the process and its result. What does the process owner have exclusive ownership of? Not the process, but its design. He or she is a person who determines what the sequence of activities is, what kind of person does what activity, and how they all get brought together to yield the result the customers want. The process owner owns design and is responsible for enabling the people who do the process to get it done. So he or she develops the design, communicates it to them, trains them in it, and gives them the facilities and the technology they need to get it done. A process owner is very much of an enabling and a supporting role. The hero of the act is not the process owner. It's the process performer on the front line. The process owner is a facilitator, a tool provider. Here's the design you need. Here are the capabilities you need. You go get them. Process owner's responsibilities can really be broken into three major areas. First is design and measurement. The process owner is responsible for ensuring that the process design is good, people know it, and that it's supported by the appropriate facilities, as we have said. The process owner is also the one responsible for measuring the process and determining how well the process is doing. Design is not a once-in-a-lifetime endeavor. The process owner does not merely create a design and then leave it. One of the things we've learned is that this world keeps changing, and the world's finest design today is going to be worthless before very long. The process owner has to manage that process and its design on an ongoing basis. Determining how it's performing, determining how well it ought to be performing by talking to customers, benchmarking competitors, and then deciding how we fill the gap between where it is and where it needs to be. Sometimes that gap is going to be filled by new tools and facilities and training for the people who do the process. Sometimes that gap is going to be filled by minor changes to the process design. And once in a while, the process owner is going to decide it's time to start over. Throw away the design we have, it's not nearly good enough, and replace it with an entirely new design. And that, by the way, is what we call re-engineering. By the way, I think I deserve a little medal here. It's been about 20 minutes, and first time I've used the word re-engineering in this video. It's a new personal best. Now, the point is re-engineering is not the thing in itself. Re-engineering is part of a larger thing. It's one of the ongoing responsibilities of the process owner as he or she discharges the responsibility of measurement, design, and design improvement. The second responsibility of the process owner is what we call guidance. Now, what do we mean by that? The process owner has created a design, has given the team who's performing the process the tools and the knowledge they need, and has said, go get them. And they go get them. And they're out there solving problems, doing work, and it's great. And then something goes wrong. They encounter a situation they're having trouble handling. What do you want them to do? Well, since they have ownership, you want them to deal with it, to come up with the solutions to this difficulty. The trouble is, what if they get stuck? Let me give you an example. A process team that I'm familiar with was working at handling orders on an order fulfillment process, doing a great job. And then out of the blue, they were snowed under with a ton of orders, more than the capacity of the company could handle. And they had to decide what to do. 
Now, they were really into it, and they were willing to take responsibility, and they came up with ideas. One person said, let's run the plant three shifts. Someone else said, let's outsource some of the production. Someone else said, let's rent some more equipment. Someone else says, let's hire in some more people. The trouble is, they couldn't get closure. And they just chased each other around the table, never getting anywhere. What did they do? They went to the process owner and they said, hey, what should we do? And you know what the process owner did? He didn't tell them, which is just right. Because if he had told them the answer, it would have been a disaster. First of all, let's say he thought the best thing to do would be to outsource some production, and he told them that. Well, the guy who thought of outsourcing production would feel pretty good, and the rest would be mad as hell and they would feel that the process owner didn't understand and they weren't being respected and what we would get is what's called vicious compliance you know that and the next time they come up with a problem they wouldn't even try to solve it because they'd say to themselves hey what we say doesn't matter the process owner is going to tell us something else and we're back to old-fashioned old-style hierarchical management with all its problems no what did the process owner do let me give you a quote. He said, I help them with the math. It's brilliant. He didn't tell them what to do. He helped them solve the problem on their own. That way, it was their solution to their problem, and they had ownership of it. And the next time they had the problem, they had the tools to solve it on their own without coming back to him. That's what we mean by guidance. It's not supervision. It's not control. It's being a resource when the process team needs help to guide them and assist them. And the third role for the process owner is advocacy. Somebody's got to speak for the process in the councils of the mighty. Someone has to get the resources that the process needs. Someone has to negotiate the interface of this process with other processes. Someone has to figure out how this process fits into the picture of the company as a whole. That's another role for the process owner. I hope that gives you a flavor of the role of the process owner. Now, there's a lot more to be said about it. The process owner is really a role, not necessarily one person. You may have a team performing the process ownership role. You may have multiple process owners for a given process. There's a lot of variations and complexities on that, which we get into in a multi-day course we teach on this. But right now, what's important for you to understand is that there is this role of process owner. It's very different from a traditional managerial job. One process owner put it to me well once. He said, comparing his role as process owner to his previous job as a traditional manager, he said it's more different than day is from night. You exercise not control, but influence. You act as a lobbyist for the process trying to encourage people throughout the organization to care about the process and to make sure that it gets done well. One process owner I know used to have 2,000 people working for him. Now he has thousands of people performing the process, but they don't, quote, work for him. They work for the customer. They work for the process. At some level, he works for them. His job is to give them what they need so they can do the process. It's a very different relationship between manager and frontline worker. I think we have to get rid of the idea of hierarchy. The manager is no longer above the worker. The process performer is on the front lines. The process owner is behind the process performer, backing him up, supporting him, giving him the tools that he requires. Process owner is not the only key managerial role in a process organization because people are extraordinarily important in a process organization and we need somebody who's going to look after them. Let's face it, Dilbert said it and I agree. The most widely told lie in the modern corporation is people are our most important asset. The truth is, in most organizations, People are treated like commodities and cannon fodder. The traditional departmental supervisor officially has two roles. One is to make sure that the work gets done, and the other is to look after the people in his or her department. 
And in reality, the departmental manager takes care of the first one and never has time for the second one. And the further truth is that at some level it doesn't matter. People are not highly leveraged in a traditional organization. My performance only matters a little because I only have a little impact on the process as a whole. The process is so dragged down with overhead and non-value adding work. There are so many other people who are going to screw it up that it really doesn't matter if I do very well. All that changes in a process organization. Processes are highly dependent and highly leveraged on the people who perform them. There isn't much non-value adding work and people make huge amounts of difference. We have to make sure that people are in a position to really do a good job. Who's going to look after those people? Not the process owner. The process owner, if you like, is an engineer. He or she is a process designer, measurer, improver. We need someone who's going to take care of the people, and that's what we call a coach. Now, coach is also a much abused and widely overused term. Many first-line supervisors simply call themselves coaches without changing anything. The role of a coach is not to tell people what to do. The role of a coach is to help develop people, to see to it that they have the personal professional skills that they need. The process owner will give them knowledge of the process. The coach makes sure they have the individual task skills they require. So we still need an engineering manager who's going to be an engineering coach, not looking after the work, but the skills. We'll have a marketing coach. We'll have a finance coach whose job it is to make sure that those people have the skills and knowledge they require. The coach also helps them managing their own careers because no longer do people belong to their managers. People identify with their teams and their process. They have to look out after their own careers and their own futures. The coach is there to support, facilitate, and enable them. Coaching is a very different job from a traditional managerial role. It requires someone who doesn't have a whole lot of ego because the glory belongs not to the manager but to the people on the front lines. Think of football. We just had a winning pass play. What do we do? We all jump on the receiver who caught the ball. We pat the back of the guard who threw the key block. And we pick up the quarterback and carry him off the field. And what do we do with the coach? We throw Gatorade on him. There is no glory on the sidelines. A coach has to be someone who gets fulfillment through helping others, not fulfillment through controlling and bossing others. The transition from traditional manager to coach is an enormous one. One person who made it calls it the transition from dictator to facilitator. The hardest part is not so much learning new skills. The hardest part is letting go of old styles which we've become accustomed to in the many years we've been practicing traditional managerial style. Process owner to design, measure, improve, guide, and advocate for the process. Coach to train, support, encourage, enable, facilitate the people. Those are the key managerial roles in a process organization. There are pretty much no other managerial roles. Traditional command and control management is irrelevant, counterproductive, even destructive in a process environment. It doesn't help create a context in which people will do process work. The role of the executive also changes in a process organization. The traditional executive is a grand decision maker, a strategic thinker, a commanding controller. In a process organization, you want decisions made at the front lines. You want people throughout the organization to be doing important work. The role of the leader is that of architect, is that of motivator, is that of leader. He or she has to create the context in which everybody else will do their work. Instead of being a decision maker, you have to be an influencer. Instead of being a controller, you're an architect. It's a big shift. The governance of a process organization is different. 
instead of having traditional executive committees, we need to have something called a process council. The process council is the senior process owners, the senior coaches, the leadership put together to make sure that all the parts of the company fit together as a whole. Because there's a risk. The risk is that we turn functional silos into process sewers. See what I mean? In a traditional organization, marketing and engineering don't talk to each other. So we work on processes that cross them to bring them together. We work on product development and order fulfillment. The trouble is we want to make sure that product development and order fulfillment fit together instead of working across purposes. The two have to add up. And if everyone is focused exclusively on his or her own process, we can replicate the kind of fragmentation we used to have, but instead of it being vertical fragmentation, it's horizontal fragmentation. How do we make sure that order fulfillment and product development fit together and work together? That's the job of the process council. It's an executive team rather than an executive committee, where the senior people work together to figure out how all the components are going to add up to create aggregate value for the customers that are really who count at the end of the day. And finally, what we might call the management systems of the organization also have to be aligned around process. Whether it's budgeting or capital allocation, planning, whatever, those have to get beyond the traditional hierarchical and functional styles to work in a process environment. We've just reviewed slightly more than a dozen different dimensions or facets of a process organization. These are the things that have to be put in place. Now, they all don't have to be put in place on day one. And they don't all get put in place the same way for every organization. But if you have a process organization, you will have all these capabilities. You will have the tools we talked about, you will have the drivers of attitudes, and you will have these new approaches to management. That's what defines a process organization and creates the environment in which process work is done well on a sustained basis. Now, don't get me wrong. I do not mean to suggest that the process organization is some kind of nirvana or heaven on earth, devoid of difficulties or problems. On the contrary. It's got some real difficulties, some real issues. First of all, there are some major costs involved, both in getting to the process organization and in being there. Training and education budgets go up very significantly. You need everybody in the organization to understand much more about the business. And you have to develop a whole new set of skills, both in your frontline people and in all the managers. This is a real serious investment. It's not uncommon for organizations that have moved in this direction to tell me that their budgets for training and education have gone up 400 or even 500 percent. Now for some of you that's no big deal. Five times nothing is still nothing. But for most companies that's a serious increase. There's also serious expense involved in reinventing and recalibrating all your management systems, rebuilding your measurement systems, rebuilding your financial systems, putting in integrated software systems to support the processes. This doesn't come for free. Perhaps most importantly, we're talking about big deal change and big deal cultural change. Let's face it, the flip side of empowerment is disempowerment. We're giving authority to the front line. We're taking it away from the managerial hierarchy. And that's not easy for them to let go of. Even for the front lines, it sounds great to have more responsibility until you really have to face it every morning. We're asking people to rewrite their social contract, to change what they expect of the company and what the company expects from them. That's not an easy transition to make. Even when we have created the process organization, even when we get there, there are still some real challenges. We have to face what I call the end of serenity and the end of clarity. For all its shortcomings, 
the traditional organization had one advantage. All I had to do is what my boss told me. There was one thing to worry about, and that was it. That's not the case in the process organization. I have to worry about a lot of things. I have to worry about the customer. I have to worry about my teammates. I have to worry about cost and speed and accuracy and flexibility. I have to worry about today. I have to worry about tomorrow. I have to make sure the process works well. I have to make sure that people have their skills. It's not just one thing. It's every damn thing. That creates a lot of tension in an organization as people are pulled in multiple directions simultaneously. In the traditional organization, only the top people had to cope with that kind of complexity and tension. In a process organization, everybody is a general manager. Everybody has the big picture, and consequently, everybody has to cope with the ambiguities, the complexities, and the tensions that the real world imposes on a real organization. But despite these issues and despite these challenges, the process organization is your destiny. There really is no choice. The levels of performance that process focus allows us to achieve create an environment which blows away companies that aren't doing it. By focusing on processes, getting rid of non-value-adding work, we can achieve such incredible improvements in cycle time, cost, flexibility, and accuracy that others simply cannot compete. But it's not merely short-term performance that's the payoff of the process organization. It's also a winner in the long run. Because it's so flexible in the use of its resources, it's the kind of company that can quickly respond to change. We're not locked in to an organizational structure. We're not locked in to a way of doing things which is so complex and Baroque and Byzantine that nobody can figure it out and consequently nobody can change it. A process organization is flexible. It's light on its feet. It's got people who are constantly working to keep it tuned with the changing needs of the market. It's a winner in the short term, and it's a winner in the long term. But perhaps most importantly, a process organization is just a better place to work. In a traditional organization, people are disconnected from the meaning of their work. They don't understand the significance or the value of it. They don't understand the context. They're out of touch with the customer, the ultimate value to which they're contributing, and they don't appreciate the value of the others with whom they're working. That creates a sense of despair, of anomie, of alienation and isolation that makes traditional organizations sad places to work. A process organization changes all that by allowing people to understand why they're working, for whom they're working, with whom they're working, people get connected to the significance and the value of their work. They look at work not only as a way to make a living, they see their work as something significant and of value which enriches not only customers, not only their shareholders, but their own personal lives. Creating that kind of environment in which people get more out of their work and consequently put more into it is the kind of prospect to which we all should aspire. And that's the real long-term value of the process organization. I wish you luck on your journey. Thank you very much.